One of the strangest disappearance cases ever recorded in history. Literally a mysterious stranger that no one ever had a record of, that vanished out of thin air just as quickly as he appeared. He appeared from out of the ether somewhere in Norway. Be around 8 a.m. September 22nd in 1987. Locomotive is driving along as usual along a railway line which was located somewhere near Oslo in Norway, somewhere between the towns of Cambo and Moss. All of a sudden, the locomotive driver spots something strange up ahead on the tracks. The locomotive driver decides not to take any unnecessary risks and slows down instead of continuing onward. Thought it might be a bag of trash or something at first, but he could not take any risks. Train gets closer and closer to the object. Realize very suddenly that it is not a bag of trash lying on the railway line. It is a body. A dead body. It is a man lying face down on the tracks on the left hand side. As soon as the train came to a stop, the driver exited the train and went to check on the men. Incredibly lucky that the body was spotted in time and was not exploded into a million pieces. Train driver reaches the body of the man. Man is very clearly deceased. Right arm and right foot separated from the man's body like they had been torn off. The man also had lots of other serious injuries and bruises all over his body. Train driver immediately contacts the police so that they can investigate and get to the bottom of the situation. Investigators arrive pretty quickly to the scene. They determine that the man was probably between 50 and 60 years of age. They examined his injuries in depth. His limbs being separated was not the only serious injury that the old man had suffered. His head had sustained a serious crushing injury and had scrape marks all down his back, like claws or fingernails had been sunken into it and dragged all the way down. The deceased man had nothing on him that could identify him at all. No driver's license, no wallet, no kind of idea, literally nothing at all. The man only had a couple of items in his pockets. He had a handkerchief that was brown in color, a Swiss army knife, and also a packet of camel cigarettes that only had a few left inside the pack. Investigators also analyzed the dead man's clothes. They discovered another strange thing upon doing this. On every single article of clothing, all of the labels had been removed entirely except for on the man's pair of underwear. The brand of this pair of underwear was something like Elan Body. Another strange thing was noted upon analyzing the man's clothes. All of his items of clothing were incredibly cheap and of very poor quality, all except for the pair of shoes that he was wearing. His shoes were very expensive. An autopsy revealed that the man had no alcohol or any other substances present in his body. The man had died from traumatic injuries that were consistent with being hit by a train. Very soon after the cause of death was concluded, the authorities made attempts to contact the relatives of the deceased man. There was just one problem with this. No one at the police department, or anywhere else for that matter, could identify the man or figure out who he was. As mentioned before, he had no form of identification on his body. Fingerprints taken from the man did not match up to any kind of database, and so the police were at a loss for what to do. They gave pictures of the deceased and other identifying features, such as weight and height, to different agencies across Europe. Nothing was ever discovered from this though. No one ever came forward claiming to know the deceased. No one recognized any of the details about him, and no missing persons reports were ever made that matched any of the identifying features of the man. The man basically did not exist at all. The only progress made in the investigation at the time was that the man was likely of German descent. This was due to the style of clothes that he was found to be wearing that were popular in Germany at the time. He was wearing a style of jacket known as a Szymanski jacket, which was popular among middle-aged German men at the time of his death, which is what brought them to this conclusion. This was literally the only detail or clue that the investigators had to go off as to the man's identity. The case very quickly became a popular topic and highly publicized by the Norwegian and over media and the man was dubbed the Cambodian or sometimes 
the Cambo Man, due to the location of where he was found. Even the increased publicity that the media brought to the case did not result in any leads being found or anyone with any knowledge coming forward. Eventually, several photos were discovered that appeared to bear a striking resemblance to the deceased man, but even these did not lead to anything during the investigation. Quote from police investigator Helga Jodelin. There are several tips, including one that the man is likely a person who was a German soldier in Norway during World War II. It turns out that this tip also does not match. Another tip refers to an ad in a so-called coupon sheet, a sheet where you can cut out coupons to order items. The man depicted in this ad is scary to the dead, but a right eye mole has a different location. Thus, the man in the ad cannot be the Cambodian. The evidence obtained throughout the case, the injuries present on the man's body, and the location that he was found led to the police investigators believing that the mysterious case was just the man taking his own life. They believed that the man had gone there with the sole intention of ending his life by train, regardless of the mysterious clues and inconsistencies presented before them. There was one more inconsistency though that cast more doubt over this theory. Taking one's own life by train is a fairly common method, but this is usually done in areas where train activity is high, most often pretty close to train stations. This man, however, was discovered on an incredibly remote stretch of train tracks where not a lot of train or any activity at all would be seen throughout the day. If he were intending to take his own life, why would he go to a place where few trains pass through and his chances of ending his own life would be slim? Furthermore, why would he put in so much extra effort to travel to this remote location when he could have simply done it at a nearby station or track? Also, being a foreigner, his knowledge of the rail system and the train routes would be quite slim, so why would he travel to such a far out route? Instead of attempting to answer any of these glaring questions, the police investigators stuck to their conclusion and filed the case away so that they would not have to deal with it anymore. The case would remain filed away until the beginning of the 1990s. The case would be reviewed, but it still seemed like no further answers would be found. About 30 years after the death of the man is when headway would be made on the case again. A police investigator by the name of Astrid Norga brought the case up once more. He wanted to use modern techniques to analyze the physical evidence that had been acquired from the case, such as DNA and blood samples, but the evidence turned out to not have been properly stored, and as such, had significantly degraded. Not entirely suspicious in itself, considering the case was considered all but concluded, but still very sloppy from the police department. However, certain items of evidence were completely and utterly missing from the storage, with no clue at all as to where they could have gone. Quote from Astrid Norga, In a box, we find clothes and items, a jacket, a sweater, a shirt, a support stocking, a handkerchief, a sleeveless shirt, a Swiss army pocket knife, a belt, a pair of Mephisto brand shoes, and a camel cigarette pack. But some of the clothes the men wore when found were gone. The underpants and denim pants, as well as one of the support stockings are gone. The images from the autopsy show that the men wore this, but it has probably been thrown because of blood spell. All of the clothes have been thoroughly washed. The material is by no means handled with regard to DNA and that type of thing, so that's the way the train has gone. The requirement to deal with this, with today's thinking, it is not present, simply. The shoes and objects are therefore not removed from the plastic bags in which they are located. In 1987, DNA technology was still in its starting phase, and it was therefore not common to secure traces in the form of biological material. Therefore, the clothes were washed so that they could be used in a search. During the autopsy, blood was taken out of the deceased but this has disappeared over the years. Thus, important tracks have been lost. Not all hope was lost, as Norga managed to uncover a small amount of blood that was present both on the deceased man's packet of cigarettes and also a small amount on the sole of one of his shoes. The amount present was small, but was just enough to conduct a DNA test with the amount that they had. Again, 
They had no idea of any familial relationships or any idea about the deceased man's family at all, so the blood sample could not be used to identify him in that way. Instead, the investigators opted to use the sample to find out where the man possibly came from, and more information about him in general. Analysis of the sample indicated that the man was likely from Colombia originally, but immigrated to Germany the same way as many other people did at the time. This analysis, however, did little in the way of providing more concrete clues of the deceased man's identity. Norga did find an extra clue that the police investigators initially overlooked. Quote from Norga, On the inside of the left shoe, we find a mysterious piece of paper that is taped. On the note is the number 15250. The police oversaw the note during the surveys in 1987. For the first time, we can also examine the shoes more closely. The blood stains that were on the shoes have been secured. We can therefore take them out of the plastic bag and study the shoes closer. Inside the left shoe, there is a patch that is taped firmly. Below the faded tape, we can see a number. 15250. It is certainly not the police that put it there. The patch has been overlooked during the surveys of the clothes in 1987. When the unidentified man was examined, they did not focus on the clothes. They also did not believe that the matter would be as great a mystery as it has become. The shoe has been tilted by the body, and it has not been looked into, until now. But what does this number mean? Can there be numbering from a used store? Could it be a secret code? Could it be a number that the owner did not want to lose? Clues as to what the number could mean were sparse. Norga managed to uncover one of a clue during his time taking on the case. This clue was a man by the name of Roy Sandberg. Roy Sandberg was actually present in the area of the railway tracks at the time of the deceased man's death. Roy Sandberg lived just a single mile away from where the death took place. At the time, Roy Sandberg was performing his duties on a transport train. Out of nowhere, he heard a sudden sound that startled him on the transport train. Roy went to check on the strange sound immediately. When he reached where he thought the strange sound was coming from, he noticed something incredibly weird. There was a hole cut into the tarp in the car that he was investigating. It was a man-shaped hole. It was precisely big enough for a man the size of the deceased man that was found to fit through it. Very odd and very specific. Roy Sandberg stated that he believed that the deceased man was actually a stowaway on the train and that it was him who made the cutout. Realistically, it seems more likely that the cutout was made for the deceased man by someone else. One last clue for the case. There was a sighting of a strange man in the area at around the time of the incident. Quote by the witness. We have found a report that was written by a station manager who moved out to the scene of the collision between Moss and Camba in 1987. In the report, the station manager writes that a locomotive on a freight train on his way to Moss observed a man with the same description as the man who was hit and killed. The man was just standing along the track. About half an hour later, the man is found dead by a locomotive. Svein Ivar Johansson, who runs the commuter train from Moss, I tracked down the forensic technician who was sent out by the police in Moss this September day in 1987. He says the first thing that struck him when he saw the scene was that the dead man might have tried to board the train. We have now perhaps got an answer to what the Cambo men did here on the deserted railway stretch between Cambo and Moss on the morning of the 22nd of September, 1987. It is less and less that indicates that it was a man taking his own life. What do you think, Axe? Do you think this dude was really just trying to take his own life, or do you think he was murdered and someone tried to cover it up? I've read rumors that the Cambo man was possibly a spy investigating the area. There was also apparently a radar station located in the vicinity that would have contained a lot of sensitive information. Question is, who would he be spying for and why? I wonder if he was maybe caught up in something much bigger whether he was aware of it or not, and some higher-ups in society needed him to be taken out without a detailed investigation, slash, any conclusive evidence. 
The thing that really gets me is the lengths that somebody went for to make tracing him impossible. No one who is thinking of taking their own life is taking the time to cut tags out of every single item of clothing except for one. And even if he was some musty old hiker and his clothes were falling apart due to age, wouldn't his underwear be the first thing to bite the dust? Not to mention the brand new pair of shoes he had. Something about this case really skeeves me out. I think either he had elite knowledge and stumbled onto something that he shouldn't have, or maybe he escaped from somewhere and someone tracked him down. Maybe the number in his shoes means he was a prisoner somewhere, and maybe he escaped from captivity and was being hunted. Those are my theories anyway, X. I haven't had many spooky experiences, but here is a weird one that I really cannot explain. B19, UK, working at a popular value store. Work in a smallish town, decently busy, but not as bad as retail in the city was. On-site staff is usually one manager, one or two senior assistants, and two to four grunts like me. Either fellow kids, or people not old enough to retire yet, one of whom babysits the tail while the rest do the proper work. In a large building that used to be something else, in Argos maybe, but we only use half the space. Ground floor is where people shop, and there is a back room where we store product and stairs. Upstairs is where the office, cloakroom, and staff toilet are, along with a shabby break room that nobody uses ever, all connected by a narrow corridor that runs the length of the building. Ah, oh, in this massive, empty warehouse that sits parallel to the corridor. It's definitely bigger than the ground floor. I think it extends over the neighboring shop. Spooky as hell. We don't use it because too many stairs, but everybody says it's unnerving to go in there. Doesn't help that the entire upper floor is uninsulated, so it is either freezing cold or smotheringly hot, but the floor is so thick that you can't really hear any of the people noise below. Anyway, go for a mid-shift pass after spending three hours stood at the tail. As I'm finishing up, I hear the sound coming from the unused warehouse. Sounds like a lot of stuff falling down, like a full shelf collapsing. Considering that we don't really store anything in there, unless we've got way too much stock, but I figure I should go and see what it was. Creak open the door, and I'm instantly taken aback by how warm it was in there, in January no less. It's been cloudy, but it feels like a greenhouse in there. Switch the light on. There is no proper windows, just a few of those glass bricks that let in a little bit of light. Absolutely no stock here, no pile of fallen stuff, nothing at all. Poke around, but there's not really much to look at besides the stock lift and a walk-in closet full of like, spare freezer dividers and plastic signs and stuff, you know? Figure it was something in there, but don't really want to hang around. The weird heat is making me a bit uncomfortable. Leave and visit the office to ask if the manager heard anything at all. Nobody in there. Must have been on the shop floor. Go back down to resume my place at the till. Notice that whoever I'd asked to watch it while I was gone has just left. I bitch about it to myself. Realize that I didn't pass the manager slash senior coming back for the stockroom. Realize that the entire shop is empty as I pace up and down. Look out the big glass window of the storefront. It's 6pm, but there is nobody out there, either. It's as if I am the only person in the whole entire town. Despite having fantasized about the scenario before, I'm freaking out a bit now. I go back upstairs, hoping that it's all just a coincidence and I'll meet some member of staff up there. Nope, and now the entire upstairs floor is enveloped in that warmth that I felt in the warehouse. Go back to the employee bathroom. The single stall we have is occupied. The door swings open if it is not locked. Want to say something, but suddenly feel very awkward, like I'm freaking out over nothing while my boss is trying to get stuff or something. Getting dizzy, probably from the stifling heat. Hand hovering, wanting to knock on the stall door, when I hear this loud slam echo around the room. Spin round sharply, but the bathroom door is still open. Look behind me again. The stall is now empty, and the door is hanging open as usual. Stumble back into the corridor, taking deep breaths and sweating. Realize it's freezing cold, like it should be. Head downstairs, and everything is normal. Co-workers think I was taking a ten-minute crap. 
Don't say anything because how do you explain that? I still don't know what happened. Never told anybody there about it. Be me, Nashville 2017. If you know anything about the city, you'll know that it was around this time it started getting big. What's important to note is that before this, the city was a near perfect blend of rural and urban. Not everywhere, but a lot of places. I lived in a suburb where driving 15 minutes in opposite directions would take you either downtown or into natural reserve territory. It was in this suburb I had my first legitimate spiritual encounter, and I will die on the hill that I did not imagine any of it. Be brother, find free 90 style TV. Beaten up, but pleasant aesthetic. Mom does not want it in the house. Hide it in the backyard until coming to decision on what to do with it. Backyard nothing but thick copses of trees and nature. Remember, depending on where you live, there is a perfect blend of city and nature. It wasn't uncommon for some neighborhoods to be divided by thick patches of legitimate forest. Eventually come to the decision to hide it in the forest. Secret forest hideout dot secrecy. Wasn't until nightfall to move it because the HOA is trash. Nightfall. Join brother to hide it in the forest. Halfway through backyard. When? Something is wrong. Feel something is wrong. Brother. What are you talking about? Seriously. Be quiet. Everything is silent on a humid summer's night. No bugs, no wind, no people, no crickets. Something is seriously out of place. Distinctly feel like we are being watched, but there are no neighbors out at 11pm. Feel multiple pairs of eyes start looking around. Nothing around. Brother starts talking again and tell him to be quiet. Do you feel that? We are being watched. No, we're not. Keep looking around because something is watching us. Multiple somethings. Feel chills up my spine and goosebumps. A few seconds later, the most stereotypical fog rolls in. Wide, covers vision, but not thick enough to not see through. Something is seriously not right. Start panicking because I cannot find the source. As quickly as it came in, the fog disappeared. Could not have been more than a minute. When it disappears, Reveal the location of the staring. I distinctly remember it, and my description has not changed in the years since this took place. To the one side of our house, next to a tree lining, was what I could only describe as an inky group of malevolent entities. I remember staring at that patch of darkness, and seeing this group's eyes piercing through my brother and I. Their stares felt oily, inky, and dark. This is the most apt description I can give of how it felt being stared at by them. Almost as important was that I could tell they were malevolent. I could tell they meant to cause harm to my brother and I. What they were going to do and when, I had no idea, but I know for a fact they meant us harm. Two groups, standing there menacingly. There is a spiritual cold war. Who is going to give first? After that incident, I remember looking at games like Final Fantasy or any of our RPGs that you have fighting spirits and gods and laughing. Standing before the two groups, I remember as clear as day I had zero amounts of fear for the simple reason that I could not comprehend what was right in front of me. I knew what I was looking at, but I could not comprehend just how overworldly these things were. I could not grasp their immensity, like recognizing infinity but only as a concept. You don't know how deep infinity really is. Malevolent group staring at us. Defending group staring at them. Continued for what felt like hours. Was most likely 40 to 60 seconds. Malevolent group vanishes like a wisp. Defending group watched them leave. Stuck around for another 10 seconds to make sure that they were gone. Leave. Crickets come back. Tell brother we'll put the TV in the woods tomorrow. What? No, let's do it now. I am not tempting that group to come back. We are going back inside. Left TV in the open. Being raised Baptist, I think those were demons and angels, respectively. My brother once asked me what I would have done had he ignored my warnings and kept walking, and I told him I'd have choked him out. It sounds edgy, but that is the only time I've ever said anything like that to him, because it was a legitimate cold war between them. If we did something stupid, I am not sure what would have happened, aside from a dreadful certainty 
that our lives would have been in legitimate danger. To this day, what astounds me most was the distinct lack of fear. I really could not grasp just how deep those entities were. Maybe others have had similar feelings, maybe different, but that was mine. Not my story, and I think it might be pretty well known, but I always thought it was an interesting one, because there is fact to it. I can't recall it verbatim, but the more pertinent parts are all there. I'll call them Woman A and Woman B, because I cannot remember their names. Two middle-aged women go camping. Do it often, because they enjoy hiking. This one time, they veer off the trail. They aren't too worried, because they are pretty experienced. But then the night starts creeping in, and they are no closer to finding the trail than they were when they first started looking. They also have few to no supplies with them, because getting lost was not on the agenda. Struggle their way through the woods in the dead of the night. Out of nowhere, they notice a light a little ways up ahead. Approach it. It's like an old-timey drinking tavern. Both look through the windows, and it even looks old-timey inside. Everything from the decor to the people. A bit perplexed why something like this would be in the middle of nowhere, but they are just glad to have found somewhere they might be able to get help. Woman A opens the door. Everyone inside turns and looks at them. Woman B suddenly feels really apprehensive and tells Woman A not to enter. Patron begins beckoning them to come inside. Woman A steps so like half her body is through the doorway. Woman B grabs hold of her and pulls her back. Can't remember if the tavern disappeared in the blink of an eye, or if it remained and they left. I think they said it disappeared. Woman A says the side of her body that crossed the threshold feels odd. Whole side of her body is paralyzed. They get rescued or whatever anyway. Woman A goes to the doctors when she is back home. Doctor, this is a part I seen on the program. He was a legit doctor, said it was just like what you would expect from someone who'd had a stroke. Except she hadn't, and he could find no physical reason whatsoever for why one side of her body was paralyzed. Saw the green text thread, and got reminded of a story my mom told me from when she was a teen. Be my mom, sometime in the mid-90s. Lived near Roberts Ferry in California. Her and some friends were messing around at night, and saw an odd light on an empty hill. Area is known for aliens and stuff, so they joked about it being that. Bored as hell, so they decided to check it out. Got to the top of the hill. Regret.jpg There is a damn craft there. They could not tell what the shape was, but it was the size of a small yacht. Something like four humanoid creatures with limbs that are elongated, pesky elbows are standing around. No noticeable skin tone or hair. They turned around and stared at my mom and her friends. After a second, they run inside their ship faster than any human and fly off after two seconds. Mom and friends run down the hill screaming. Mom came back in the late 2000s to see what the spot was like. It is government property now, and it is fenced off. She used to have a detailed drawing of them, but she is unsure whether she has it anymore. I probably will make a post with it if she ever finds it. Stay safe, Anons. There is some crazy stuff out there. Just some extra content to add. They walked on all fours. They were just moving around and seemingly inspecting the ground when her and her friends found them. My mom does not like to talk about it because of how terrifying the experience was. If this thread lasts long enough, I might be able to make an extremely rough sketch of what they were described as. Alright, I gotta sketch down. It's as good as I can do, but it should work. That's pretty close to how it was described. The only thing is that she couldn't tell the actual shape of the craft, more just the size, and she could not see any fine detail on it aside from the eyes and the elongated arms. Not spooky, but a close brush with death. Where could a liquor store? This guy comes in. Buff dude with tats. Gives off a funny energy when he walks in. Just seems off, and I keep an eye on him, thinking maybe he's drunk. But when he comes up to the counter, he is as nice as could be. I even notice from his ball cap that we root for the same team. We have a friendly exchange about that, and the guy leaves. Basically don't think about that for the rest of the day. 
That night, I clock out. Thinking of stopping in at this bar I sometimes visit after work. Decide against it because I am tired. Go home and watch movies or something, and then I go to bed. Next morning, read about a shooting at the bar I was going to go to. Read the guy's name. Sounds vaguely familiar. They have a mugshot. It's the buff dude that gave me that weird feeling at the liquor store. According to the article, the dude suspected his GF of cheating on him. Then he caught her at the bar with her other man, pulled out his gun, and shot the dude and his GF. Shot a security guard who tried to intervene, and even injured some randos who were sitting at the bar. Could have been me. Talk about a close call, lol. 